Hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining our Arizona portion of uh, the Chinatown Hall this year. Um, and we just heard the national portion of the seminar, of the webinar. And now we are very fortunate to have Frank Hawk as our local um, speaker slash moderator. And because we're taking the virtual for, form, format, um, we're gonna ask you to type your questions in the chat box. And I'm gonna read those questions to, uh, to Frank and then we will have discussions. And so before we start, um, in case um, you don't know me yet, my name is Wen Hao Diao. Uh, I am the co-director the, at the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona. Um, when we saw the Chinatown Hall partners, uh, we actually noticed that quite a few of the, the different localities were actually hosted with, uh, by our partners uh, in many of the CIS events. So please, um, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our CIS newsletters and also our social media um, and there are a lot of opportunities for events and, uh, and other, um, we actually have quite a few things coming up just next week. And so also allow me to briefly introduce Frank Hawk. Um, until recently, Frank Hawk was the China director for the Stanford University Graduate School of Business based at the Stanford Center at Peking University. Previously, he was Asia Regional Director for the International Potato Center, an international research and development NGO that focuses on food security and poverty reduction, and the chairman, Greater China of uh, Crow Associates, as well as an independent consultant assisting companies with business strategies in China. In the early 1980s, Frank assisted numerous firms conclude landmark early deals in China, including the Great Wall Hotel, China's first joint, event, uh, joint venture, and the Beijing Jeep Corporation. He worked for Citibank from 1988 to 1994, managing business in the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, and he headed a team that re-established Citibank in Vietnam. From 1994 to 1997, Frank was head of investment banking for Solomon Brothers China. Frank has served as an independent director on the boards of China Everbright Bank, JP Morgan Chase China, and Sun Life Everbright Insurance Company, a large state-owned financial services firm. He also served as an independent director on the board of Khan Bank, Mongolia's largest commercial bank. Frank has taught extensively at Stanford, and he currently teaches at Peking University and the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies, the Jesuit, the Jesuit Study in China Center. And welcome, Frank. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I would only add that I'm a, also a proud uh, fourth generation Southern Arizonan and uh, graduate of Saguaro High School here in Tucson. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona for hosting this, I think, important event. And in particular, uh, Wang Hao, you and, and your colleagues for inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm greatly honored. Um, today, we heard from what I would call an, an architect of U.S.-China relations. Uh, there are many architects of U.S.-China relations in the halls of power and academia in both China and the U.S., Sadly, perhaps fortuitously, I am not one of them. Rather, I am what I would call a practitioner of U.S.-China relations. Uh, my entire adult life has been spent in and around China. My financial exposure to China, um, in terms of how I have made a living for the past 45 years, and where a large portion of my financial assets were located until recently, has been enormous. My beautiful wife was born and raised in Beijing, and her entire family is in China. Our sons are completely bilingual and bicultural with grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, and cousins on both sides of the Pacific. We have long lasting and deep friendships with people in both countries. We, we practitioners, and, and that includes corporations, by the way, we have to live and work in the house of US-China relations that the architects designed for us. Uh, with that in mind, and in an effort to provoke some discussion, I want to address two common and unhelpful viewpoints that I frequently hear among the architects and some practitioners on both sides. These viewpoints share two problems in my view. 
One is that each is flawed uh, in its formulation. And the second is that each is unhelpful in addressing the issues in the bilateral relationship. Time is limited, so I will cover each quickly. We can return to them in Q&A if, if, if there's an interest. The US and China each suffers from what I call a chip on its shoulder. Uh, that is a perceived grievance so great that it can cloud objectivity and distort behavior. The Chinese chip or grievance in my view is that China was for most of pre-modern history, the largest economy in the world and the apotheosis of human civilization until the Westerners came along with their superior technology that they lucked into and subjugated not only China, but much of the rest of the world. Thus, by 1949, when the Chinese Communist Party successfully reunited China and expelled the imperialists from Chinese soil, China was an economic basket case and a cultural backwater. China, therefore, in its view, is entitled to restoration to its rightful place as a global power. And the so-called West is dedicated, in their view, to containing China and preventing it from doing so. Geopolitically, China fully intends to become a regional and then a global power. Virtually all Chinese at all levels believe this is China's birthright. It's axiomatic. Why is this flawed? Well, first, in the pre-modern world, population was the main generator of economic growth, power, and status. For numerous reasons that world historians debate endlessly, for the past 2,000 years, the gravitational pull of a single united China has generally overcome the centrifugal forces attempting to pull China apart. Europe, for equally interesting and hotly debated reasons, saw centrifugal forces overpower gravitational forces over the same period, leading to a perennially divided European continent. A simple outcome of this, and the fact that China developed an effective policy polity as well, is China overwhelmingly had the largest population in the world during the pre-modern period, and therefore the largest economic surplus with which to underwrite a flourishing culture. And here's the flaw. The world doesn't work that way anymore. Since the advent of the Industrial Revolution and modern economic growth, defined as sustained growth in per capita GDP, economic power and status are determined much more by innovation and effective governance than by the traditional drivers of land, labor, and capital. In terms of governance alone, one need only compare Russia and Singapore to understand this. The second flaw in this grievance in this grievance narrative is the US and the West more broadly until very recently has not only not sought to contain China, but has been the single greatest facilitator of China's rise other than the Chinese people. More on that in a moment. This is my plea as a practitioner of US-China relations to the, to the Chinese architect, to the Chinese architects of US-China relations. The world owes you nothing. Shed these flawed grievances and associated paranoia and focus on becoming a constructive player in a system that yes, you did not create. And yes, not all of the rules favor only you yet which has been a critical facilitator for your historically unprecedented rise and which can continue to be so. The American chip or grievance is that China shows insufficient gratitude to the US and the so-called US led rules-based order for China's achievements. Some recent historical context I think is useful here. In early, in early 1979, when I first arrived in China, China accounted for roughly 24% of global population and just over 1% of global GDP. Think about that for a moment. That right there is a pretty good definition of poverty. It was in December of 1978 that Deng Xiaoping, in recognition of China's dire straits, promulgated his new program of reform and opening up. The essence of the program was everything, including foreign policy, had to serve the goal of rapid economic development. What this meant was China would not rock the boat globally by challenging the US, and China would stop fomenting revolution and make friends regionally. All of this was necessary in Deng's view to attract the capital, 
technology and know-how necessary for China's rapid catch-up, for it has been and still is all about catching up. Deng's policy can be summed up by the well-known Chinese catchphrase, Tao Guang Yang Hui, meaning hide one's capacities and bide one's time. This was the essence of Deng Xiaoping's foreign policy. Deng's intent was not to shelve permanently China's ambition to be a world power, as just mentioned, an ambition shared by the elites and the masses in China, but rather to delay that ambition until China possessed the economic and military wherewithal to achieve that ambition. By virtue of the efforts of the Chinese people and with the support of the so-called rules-based global order mentioned above, China has made great strides economically. This is well documented. Hundreds of millions of Chinese have been lifted out of poverty. The US and its partners among the so-called developed countries have been the greatest external facilitators of China's rise, not Russia, not North Korea, not Iran. It was not a coincidence that at the same time Deng announced his reform and opening program in December of 1978, that he, along with President Jimmy Carter, announced the resumption of diplomatic ties between the US and China, and perhaps more important, uh, the beginning of scholar exchanges, which inaugurated a veritable gold rush of Chinese students and scholars to the US predominantly to study STEM fields and take their knowledge and skills back to China to support economic reform. Deng was fully aware that Chinese economic reform was a dead letter without support from the US and the rest of the West, which, were, which we were happy to provide. Fast forward to the end of the 20th century and we again find the US as China's biggest external facilitator, as China's sponsor for membership in the WTO, which drastically reduced impediments to China's exports uh, entering WTO member countries, and which drove China's GDP growth to near double digit rates for almost a decade. Additionally, the US opened its deep capital markets to Chinese firms seeking equity capital to support growth. Much of this capital has been supplied by ordinary US citizens through pension funds. The US also supported inclusion of the renminbi in the IMF special drawing rights or SDR basket of currencies as a show of support to China's financial reformers. These are just some examples of ways in which the US led rules-based order has played a critical role in facilitating China's rise. Nobody else could have done it. Many in the West are therefore left wondering at China's pivot to a more aggressive foreign policy that seems to break the foundational rules of the Dungist policy. Now China seems perfectly happy challenging the US at a regional and a global level. And it seems perfectly content to alienate regional players, while at the same time cozying up to actors that contributed little or nothing to its successful rise. What happened? Why is China so ungrateful? I have my own theory, but time doesn't permit discussing it here. But why is this oft expressed US grievance flawed? The first, is not so much a flaw as a reality check. The benefits of China's rise have not flowed in a single direction. The US and West also benefited in numerous ways, not the least of which were long periods of low prices and low interest rates. Time doesn't permit a full discussion of all of the ramifications of China's rise, but it is sufficient to say the US has benefited enormously from China's rise, including being the beneficiary of China's enormous brain drain. Second, to echo the discussion of China's grievances, the past is the past. We live in a new world. To quote the classic broker's lament, past performance is no guarantee of future results. So this is my plea as a practitioner of US-China relations to the US architects. China owes us nothing. We cannot nor should we attempt to stop China's rise. We should continue to channel China's rise within the existing system, which has been so beneficial to China over the past 46 years and which continued, can continue to be so. Cooperate where we can, resist and constrain where we must by ma maintaining alliances and building coalitions. Above all, we must demonstrate to China and others 
that constructive participation in the global system system can be and should be a positive sum game. I'll stop here. Uh, I see that we have a lot of China expertise on the call. Uh, so I look forward to having a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I don't know if I agree with everything you've said, but I will Good. Good. I will make sure that we get the audience questions first. Good. Um, so um, we had a question from uh, Eleanor Birmingham um, and the question during the, the national webinar. And the question is, what do military maneuvers in the South China Sea do for the U.S.? They do nothing for the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they create, as I just said, um, this is just one example of the switch from the Dungas foreign policy of, of trying to create a, an environment within which China can focus on economic, economic development to a different foreign policy, it seems, where the Chinese government no longer seems to be concerned about that. And uh, this, what's going on in the South China Sea is simply one example of, of that seemingly transformation of China's foreign policy. Um, and it's, it's seen certainly by the US and other nations in, in the region as highly provocative. Uh, it actually violates uh, an international uh, a court uh, judgment against China in this regard. And so I think it's one of these things that simply is an indicator of this pivot of China's foreign policy uh, from the Dungan's foreign policy to the new, new regime's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And the next question, I think that was raised um, because during the national webinar, um, uh, Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell talked about, got a question about, you know, um, Taiwan and mainland China, right? And so the question is, what happened to our former lip service to the One China Agreement? Uh, I, I think it's still in place. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. my understanding of the U.S. government's official position is that uh, uh, we still adhere to the original Shanghai communique of 1972, in which the U.S. recognizes that both sides of the China Strait, of the Taiwan Strait, uh, believe there's one China um, and that Taiwan's part of China. My understanding is official U.S. government policy has not changed in that regard. Yeah, I think that's my understanding as well. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, you may actually, um, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself, but feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question or, you know, if if you prefer to type in the, in the chat. I'm just uh, giving folks a little bit more time to type questions or we're trying to unmute. Uh, we do have quite a few people who are joining us. So if you would like to um, ask a question, just, just start to speak so that we know. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, well, how you said you have some issues. Let's get let's get into it. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I I very much, I think largely, I I very much agree with you that there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be because it's it's mutually beneficial, as you have said. I do feel that I do not completely agree with you on the analysis of, of China's success in the past, even though you did say that the past is not necessarily the future. I, I would like to say that, you know, that you you said that China's sentiment is that that China was, um, you know, a, 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 at least a regional power for a very long time, right? Um, and, and you seem to contribute or attribute that to the population alone. And I'm not sure if I completely agree with that assessment because um, because we do know that you know China also had a lot of innovation in the in its history, both not just scientifically but also you know culturally, politically as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No. Okay. Let me clarify. My I I totally agree with you, and 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 I, I I'm I, I'm I'm uh, I'm sorry if I gave the opposite impression that the, that it was less complex than it really was. <laughs> And just let me go back to my original comments. Um, first of all, I, I focused on, you know, for a society to be able to achieve what China did achieve. Uh, and, I, and I said in my comments that it was the hypothesis of human civilization for a couple of thousand years, right? So I, I did give China tremendous credit in that regard. But the reason they were able to achieve that was through having 
a, a, an economy and able to achieve economic surplus to support that level of, of cultural achievement, it requires a certain amount of, you know, two things, economic development, which at that time in, in world history is driven, really driven by population, but also as I was very careful to state, and also the development of a polity, mm. a set of political institutions, right, uh, which China is famous for. Uh, it, it, all you have to read is read Francis Fukuyama in his recent two-volume history of, of Chinese of, of political development in the world. He himself, you know, says China was the first to achieve this complex political uh, sort of polity, mm -hmm. which per, which would permit it, therefore, to sustain this economic. I mean, uh, uh, surplus and then channel it into the ways you talk about, into innovation, into this sort of, you know, cultural efflorescence mm -hmm. that again, you know, was, was the, you know, was the envy of the world for, mm -hmm. for, for a long time. So you and I have, have zero disagreement in this regard. I, I think maybe I just maybe underplayed it a little bit uh, in my comments. That's fine. We actually have quite a few questions now. Um, so uh, I think we have Maria Morgan first, uh, Maria Morgan first, and then Albert. Yes. Well, next. before Maria says anything, let me just say, I just mentioned there's a lot of China expertise on this call. She's one of them. Uh, okay. Maria, Maria is a PhD in political science from Stanford University and taught Chinese, Chinese politics for decades. So Maria, how are you doing? I'm fine. I have no expertise and therefore I have a question. <laughs> Do you worry if Trump get re-elected, that he will unilaterally recognize Taiwan's independence? Uh, no, I do not. Um, uh, I, I think, and I have, I have no personal, I, haven't, I, I don't know Donald Trump, I'm not involved in this campaign. Mm -hmm. um, my, 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 my guess is by virtue of having been president once, uh, that he's familiar with the issues around Taiwan and, and, and the mainland, and it's has probably educated himself about them. And and I think if that has slipped in some fashion in the in the interim, if he's president again, he will be reeducated in this regard. And, and this th this gets me to a, I think a general point about the role of China in in U.S. electoral politics. China is is one of those issues on which. Democrats and Republicans tend to come together <laughs> and agree on. Uh, China bashing is a is a favorite uh, activity of both Democrats and Republicans during what people call you know the silly season um, of electoral politics, and, and so there's a history of of especially the non incumbent uh, uh, candidate bashing the incumbent on being too soft on China. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then inevitably what happens if, if the non-incumbent gets elected, he gets into power and then he understands the, the, the issues better and the experts talk to him and then he, he falls in line to essentially what has been the policy for some time. So that, that's just sort of a history of, 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 of the role of China in electoral politics. But no, I mean, without any personal knowledge or anything, I, I, I don't think Donald Trump would would recognize an independent Taiwan. And quite frankly, my view is the Shanghai communique and, and subsequent legislation in the United States commits us to the defense of Taiwan only under the original supposition that both sides of the Taiwan Strait agree that there's one China and Taiwan's part of China. Uh, and, and my personal view is, and I, I would hope a view being expressed to, to the Taiwanese, maybe sub Rosa, is that if you if if you declare independence, that that's gone. I and mean, that's our commitment was not based on that. It was based on something else. Um, but that's just again my personal view. Yeah, and Albert um, also has a question. Another person with tremendous China expertise. Exactly. <laughs> well, everyone no, but, else in the audience has I, more. I, I, I'm starting to get real humbled here. <laughs> no, 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 no. But but uh, maybe uh, some kind of experience, but of of uh, of centuries past. <laughs> Not so much of, of well, current. Well, okay. oh. give given my age, I'm getting there too. I can talk about <laughs> I can talk about centuries past pretty soon. <laughs> anyway, anyway, lovely to see you, Frank, and wonderful to hear your perspective. I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm I wanted to get your thoughts in a little bit different direction, 
because I mean, you and I, we've observed the, you know, this is kind of more of a regional kind of question. It's not, uh, it's, you know, well, let me put it this way. I have some colleagues who say, you know, we, we've been, we've been here before. We've seen this script before. And I know I was in Japan during the eighties when, when we went through the Japan is number one phase and Japan was, uh, um, well, there was lots of talk of Japan taking over the the economic system and taking over the order. The um, um, the talk in Japan was uh, talking about the evolution of civilizations, going from Pax Romana to Pax Britannica to Pax Americana, and that that it was inevitable that they were going to be at Pax Japonica. I mean, this seems like probably quaint talk at this time, but it was quite serious in the 1980s. They, uh, oh, I remember, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, and, and and you know, there were a lot, there was lots of uh, uh, so-called, uh, lots of acrimony on both sides of the Pacific uh, about it. Um, there was Japan bashing in the US um, and there were e equally vitriolic uh, kind of opinions being expressed in Japan. And so I have some colleagues who say, well, you know, uh, it, it, we've been here before. It's inevitable that China will kind of uh, fall in line, have to fall in line as Japan had. Now, I have my own opinions about this, but I, I wonder if you have any any thoughts on on this, um, you know, that that uh, th this idea that this is not a new phenomenon with, uh, you know, for the U.S. in terms of its relationship with uh, powerful um, rising economic uh, forces in the Pacific region. Uh, I mean, Japan uh, became the number two economy in the world at that point in time uh, right. with a much, you know, with a smaller population and a much smaller population than China, of course, and a smaller population right. than Mm -hmm. even in the US. So um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on, on, yeah. on this? Yeah. So no, I, I think that, no, I think it's a great observation. Um, and uh, just a personal anecdote is back in the 80s when you talked about uh, the rise of Japan and Japan kind of taking over the world and we're all going to be speaking Japanese in 20 years and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I actually experienced that. I took a, a delegation from the first auto works in Changchun in, uh, in Jilin, uh, Jilin, China. Um, and uh, we were working with Chrysler on a potential technology transfer. And we were being given a tour. The Chinese group was being given a tour through the, the plant, uh, one of the Chrysler plants. And there was palpable antagonism from the workers on the line at Chrysler because they 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 assumed they were Jap they assumed we were leading Japanese through the plant, not Chinese. And uh, there were remarks made, there was sullen looks you know sent our way. And actually, a few times as we walked through, I said, you know, these are not Japanese, <laughs> these are these are Chinese people, right? And 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 when I said it, people kind of visibly relaxed and and weren't weren't as hostile to those who were able to overhear me. So, yeah, I I, I remember those days and and had some personal experience with them. Um, I, I believe that uh, the the issue of falling in line, obviously there's a great difference. Uh, Japan had to fall in line. We more or less told them to fall in line and, and they, they kind of, they had no way to not to fall in line. There were voluntary export controls. Uh, they, uh, you know, revalued the currency at the time. Uh, under U.S. pressure, and then the U.S. had levers it could pull that it doesn't have with China clearly. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that's that's one important difference. Also, one important difference is uh, both China and Japan hit a wall economically uh, for different reasons. Um, in Japan's case, they hit the wall after they had become fairly affluent. Um, in China's case, they're hitting the wall, and they're only at 25% of U.S. global GDP, of U.S. per capita GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan was way above that when they hit their economic wall. Uh, and this is a huge, 
this is a huge problem for China. And it, it is connected to another problem that China has and that it's, it's aging population. Um, China, Japan aged out, started aging out. In other words, uh, it's, it's percentage of older retired people being a huge percentage of the population. They started aging out again after China was fairly, uh, Japan was fairly affluent. In China, again, that's not happening. They're aging out again at only 25% of US per capita GDP. So the question was asked a long time ago is, uh, will China get rich before it gets old? Now, at the time that question was asked, you could already answer it. And the question was no. Uh, China is aging out at a much lower level of affluence than Japan did when it aged out. So that's a, another major difference with regard to the two economies. Now, I teach a course on the Chinese economy, and, uh, and I can tell you China is facing tremendous um, challenges uh, with its current economic growth model, which continues to be investment-driven and export-led, uh, as opposed to being driven by you know, 1.3 million consumers. Uh, Kurt Campbell just referenced that in his talk uh, uh, referring to Janet Yellen's trip to, to, to Beijing recently and, and trying to convince the Chinese and the Chinese themselves have been saying this for 10 years. We're not trying to convince them to do something that they themselves don't believe they need to do. And that's to transition your economy from being investment driven, export led to being consumer driven, demand, demand driven and, and service driven. And the Chinese themselves have been saying this for years. They have refused to do it. Again, we could have an entire seminar on why that's happened. Um, but the China continues to try to export its model rather than change it. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a classic example of China trying to export demand uh, as opposed to creating it internally, exporting products uh, to other markets. Uh, is another example of trying to export their way out of the problem as opposed to changing the fundamental problem, address the fundamental problem of China's growth model being out of date and incredibly inefficient. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the basic problem of China's economy. It's terribly inefficient by all measures of what economists call total factor productivity, which is the measure of an economy's efficiency. China is extremely inefficient, getting less efficient. And, and this is not how China is going to make its way out of what economists call the middle income trap. We have a question from David Peets, another China expert here. Um, we uh, And that's a question that I think a lot of us share. At least I share that question too. What do you think it will take to get students in the U.S. to get interested in studying China and Chinese again? Oh, wow. That's a great question, David. Mm -hmm. Uh, and an important question, uh, because I, I've seen this in my 45 years. You know, I was in the first group of American scholars that went to China in 1979. And, 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 and at the time, I was as interesting. It's a funny story. It, it was a big deal. Um, and, and I was on I was interviewed on the radio in, in you know, I was at Stanford now and I was interviewed on the radio at, at uh, in the Bay Area. And it was actually a Chinese American interviewer. And, and we were talking about my being in the first group and being chosen by Stanford to go. And she, and she asked me a question that really threw me for a loop at the time. She says, are you afraid? I said, afraid of what? <laughs> she said, no, are you afraid to go to China? I mean, are, are, are you afraid? And I, I really threw me for a loop. And I, I had to think about it, thinking, well, maybe she knows something I don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't want to immediately answer, thinking, well, okay, what does she know that I don't know? And I really, no, I don't think, you know, no, I, I'm not afraid. In fact, you know, I, I think our group really represents a new turn in you know, in U.S.-China relations, my guess is we're probably going to be taken pretty good care of, <laughs> given how symbolic we were. And in fact, I, I, it turned out to be true. We it, it took great care of us. But, you know, beginning of that time, there was sort of this, this fear of China or you know, going to China. And of course, through the years, it's been different at, at, at different times. And so uh, the sentiment about going to China to study and, and do things has waxed and waned. And as we heard today, and as we all know, it's 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 waned a great deal for lots of reasons. But 
it's and and one of those reasons is is I think the difficulty in the relationship, uh, the 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 mistrust, the suspicion, and quite frankly, I think a heightened sense of danger, um, of of going to China and is this, you know, is this really something I want to do compared to other things I need to get done in my life, and and, and so whereas, you know, students I taught over the decades they felt like you know china was something they needed to understand no matter what they did in their life going forward business or academia they needed to develop a good understanding of china now i think people still think that way but i think they're thinking well maybe i don't have to go to china to do that i can maybe check that box in some other way or put it off or, or whatever but these are particularly these are exactly the times when we need people mm -hmm. uh, to be studying Chinese, learning about Chinese. It's, it's when the relationship is difficult that we need to rely on people who really understand uh, the, the two sides and can speak and stand up and speak on behalf of both sides and, and, and be that bridge. So it, great, it concerns me greatly that the number of students have, have gone down. And, and I think we as educators and, and mentors, you know, we have a responsibility for doing that. But as as Kurt said, you know, there's there are things that are outside of our control, like State Department travel protocols, uh, like uh, people getting uh, arrested in China, not not being allowed to leave, uh, concerns about academic freedom, uh, things like that, and and those are outside our control, and and they naturally have an impact on on how people think about you know uh, spending time in China. Well, I do see a question from the audience, but let me ask a follow-up question because mm -hmm. you mentioned this, because again, this question is just very important for us, oh, yeah. both as a center and as a department. Um, so you said that perhaps people think, you know, people have these concerns, safety or mm -hmm. otherwise, right, about China. And therefore, maybe that that's why they're not learning Chinese or, or about China. But then let's look at the history, right? When during the, the Cold War era, um, that was when the interest in learning Russian reached its peak historically, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is it not happening to to Chinese in China? Oh uh, well, I guess I'll turn the question around on you. You're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, I think you did your you did your PhD work on 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 uh, on students' exchanges and stuff, didn't it? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, I hate to put you on the hot spot, <laughs> but I, I I'd love to hear your view, quite frankly, and I'll I'll respond to that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's clearly baffling to me. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the interest in studying abroad in Russia or the then Soviet Union was reaching its peak during the Cold War era. That was not the case. But the interest in, you know, at least we see, you know, enrollments in Russian language classes, Russian co uh, cultural classes and Russian departments overall, we see a lot of growth during that era. Um, I don't know. I think that there is perhaps we're seeing some kind of shift that we are shifting from uh, one era when we have at all these students who are interested in learning Chinese or, or China because of business or economics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those students naturally wouldn't necessarily be interested in national security <laughs> and learning Chinese for national security. Whereas, you know, for, for Russian, I don't think there was a time before that. Um, and perhaps also, like you said, that... Um, there wasn't, um, you know, for Russia, there was also uh, perhaps the, the 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 liberal wing politics in the U.S. I wasn't here. That's, I wasn't born. <laughs> and so I don't know if I'm saying this uh, uh, accurately. But at least I think that there was also the, the liberal wing in the U.S. that was actually somewhat supportive of the Soviet Union ideology, which, I, which like you were saying, this is on China. This is where the two parties in the U.S. actually unite, right? They have a lot of... They, they they share a lot of commonalities rather than having different opinions. So I don't know, maybe maybe that that's that too. We do see, um, you know, I was just at a conference over the weekend, uh, the past weekend. We do also hear that um, this is not very public yet, but I don't mind sharing it. We actually heard that the Congress is actually cutting a lot of support for national security related language initiatives, um, we're seeing um, reductions, not increases in uh, in programs that uh, federally fund learning yeah. the learning of Chinese um, at the college level or the K through sixteen K through 
12 level, um, which was not happening during the Cold War era. So I think that there's the, the shifting interest, um, the changing bipartisan politics, um, and also the lack of congressional federal right. support. Well, well, Those well, are my theories. I mean, that, that's just a couple of quick points. And we need to reinstall the Fulbright's program. I mean, that just absolutely has to be restarted and refunded. Absolutely. Uh, I myself was the beneficiary of four years of what at the time was called a, uh, a National Defense Foreign Language Fellowship, which was a government fellowship to to yeah. study Chinese back in, when I was in college. I was a, I went to China on that essentially paid for me to me in China. Uh, so yeah, I I, I I I agree that this is very important. But as you heard Kurt Campbell saying in his in his response to Steve Orleans, the State Department is recruiting, is trying to get Chinese speakers. Yes. So there are opportunities there. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully, our students can hear that too. Yeah. An advertisement: We, uh, the Center for East Asian of uh, East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona, is actually offering Tibetan language classes for free mm. to U University of Arizona students. So, if any audience member you have, uh, you know, folks who are studying at U of A, please get in touch with us because we can offer uh, remote Tibetan language classes for free. Mm. Uh, Carol, have David come over and teach some Tibetan. <laughs> There you go. And then I, next... I'm going to sign up. Thank you so much. I've been looking for something like that. Thank you. Sure. Um, next, Rich, Rich, uh, why the Worth, worth, worth Wertheimer, another person. Okay. With I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Richard spent a, uh, his 40 years in, in Asia as an investment banker, mostly on the buy side, and has mm. incredible expertise on looking at China, primarily, you know, from a financial investor point of view. Hey, Rich, how you doing? Hey, hey, Frank, how's it going? All right. Um, Aloha. So actually, I was gonna, I was gonna ask actually the question about uh, about the the lack of um, exchanges and interactions, and you know, the, the interest <laughs> levels as well. Somebody else mm. asked that question, so I was just um, because it is. It's obviously a, it's a concern, particularly for somebody who's a product of that, of that, you know, of that process, you know, back when we were in China. Um, and I was just, you know, to, to sort of my sense is when we went and the reason why there was, I think, interest is, is that China was opening up and it, it senses now it's kind of going to like ping pong diplomacy in reverse. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, and you see this on a, on a very grassroots as well as institutional level. So I thought I'd just throw you two softball questions um one is how does the situation with taiwan get resolved or how do you see that getting resolved oh wow and what's the next one so i hope it's even easier <laughs> this, yeah, this, mm. uh, just picking up on the on the growth versus security issue how does that how, how does that end it, it, sort of like the same same idea what's you know something has to give and how mm. does that sort of play out yeah yeah two really yeah, thanks, Rich. Really. Yeah, I'm here for you. I, I now regret sending you the notice for this session. <laughs> um, Taiwan, Taiwan, man, Taiwan. Um, you know, I think next to the Middle East, this is the toughest one in, on the globe right now, uh, how it gets resolved. Um, now, having said that, and having been around China long enough, um, we outsiders... <laughs> can come up with a thousand scenarios about how the Taiwan, the mainland Taiwan situation can get resolved. And the Chinese and the mainlanders and the Taiwanese are, are going to come up with a thousand and first yes. that we didn't think of, right? To either reduce tensions or to resolve it completely. So uh, the question is, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, all, all we, I think the United States can do, is do everything in its power to ensure that both sides of the strait are thinking in constructive ways on how to do this, not in destructive ways of how to do this. Um, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of ink spilled in the press about you know, what would happen in a mainland Taiwanese conflict, who would win, who would lose. And one how we've had this conversation. You know, I, I think you, one has to put yourself in the Xi Jinping's position of even if the mainland were to win such a military conflict, the real problem starts the day after they win. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to do with this place? We're going to have 20 some million disgruntled people, perhaps a guerrilla warfare that we have to deal with. They're not going to get 
TSMC, it will be destroyed. All the human capital will be gone. Um, and, and the world will now be, you know, if, if you thought sanctions up till now were difficult, wait till, you know, China attacks Taiwan, what kind of global economic environment will, will that be for, for, for China? Again, at 25% of US GDP per, P, P per capita, right? So for all those reasons, I, I think it's highly unlikely that that the mainland would launch uh you know a frontal attack now there like i said there's a thousand different ways this could happen that aren't so frontal or confrontational uh i've always said that you know china could take taiwan essentially with a press conference you know simply by saying oh by the way taiwan airspace is now chinese airspace if you want to fly a commercial airline into taipei you got to get our permission uh you know just what would that do to the, to the Taiwanese economy, right? Uh, just saying things like that, it, you know, really exerting China's views on on Taiwan status, not just saying it, but starting to exert those views in nonviolent ways. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's a thousand ways this could play out, and 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 and, and they'll figure out the thousand and first. Um, but it gets to your second question. And I don't remember the, exactly what the question was, but you know how how China's economic problems play out. There are two possible, well, two main roads. I think one is that we kind of see if China is sort of moderating at least its its um, its speech uh, on U.S.-China relations and foreign policy uh, overall. Uh, being more moderating, uh, I think they've seen that their economic problems you know, are approaching insurmountability, going back to the dungest sort of phase where, well, we need the international, we need the international system to help us here, right? We can't do this on our own. And I, so I, I think we do see a certain moderating of that uh, in speech. The question is, as Kurt Campbell mentioned and Steve Orleans mentioned, are we going to see it in reality? That's sort of one road, which is the welcome road. Uh, the other road, which would be less welcome, is if we see crisis in China as a result of various things happening, including the economy, and 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 the leadership in China feels a need to lash out and to scapegoat uh, external players and, and and to create crises in order to. You know, this is the classic. This is the classic playbook. Um, that's another possible road which we none of us want to see and and we need to work to avoid but uh, I, I you know i can't say that's not impossible um i don't know if that answered your question or not yeah it did thank you thank you for those very difficult questions um do we have any oh. more <laughs> Because, yeah. you know, I feel like whoever can answer how to yeah, resolve should, the Taiwan yeah, issue. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to Rich one day. You, you, <laughs> you'll, you'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Or do we have any comments, thoughts? Yeah, tell me I'm crazy. Come, let's talk about it. <laughs> I would like to just add a little bit more because, you know, we are University of Arizona and um, we are in a fairly strategic and uh, how should I, for lack of a better word, let's just say strategic position uh, in the in the sort of China, Taiwan, U.S. triangle. Um, so uh, as Frank has mentioned several times, um, uh, the Taijidian, right? The tia. I always know the Chinese word, and, and I have to think about the English word. The tia, uh, TSMC, right? The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing oh, mm -hmm, Corporation mm -hmm. is building its actually third factory uh, right now in Arizona, uh, and so um, so the we um, it's for those of you who are in Arizona, this is this is a a a. A love triangle that we feel here, and that's also why we think it's really, really important in this state uh, to really know and learn more about 
uh, China and Taiwan and also the US. Although I'm sure I'm preaching to the core. If you are here in this webinar, you're invested in this relationship already, you're already you know, wanting to know more about the China-US relationship and how to increase the interest in learning about China. How do we get the word out? We yeah. welcome your suggestions here. <laughs> well, actually your, your comments will actually point to, I think an issue uh, that the United States is grappling with in its dealings with China. And that's the debate over to the extent to which the U.S. should be in, in, in you know, uh, indulging in, I say indulging in, or pr pursuing uh, industrial policy uh, mm -hmm. in our own economy. Uh, you know, the United States traditionally is an open market economy. And, and some people think that the Chinese have taken advantage of us in that regard. And Kurt Campbell mentioned that, you know, the Chinese complaining about, you know, the U.S. government perhaps, maybe, Right, putting restrictions on TikTok, while Google and Facebook and all of the all of the, uh, the social media platforms, in the United States are absolutely banned in China, mm -hmm. and, and, and so you know I think there's a rising tide in the United States of people saying, "Oh, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're, you know, free trade is great as long as everybody plays by the same rules, mm -hmm. but if 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 a major player doesn't, then we we kind of have to protect ourselves," and so there's a growing rise of sentiment for the U.S. to act to also. Uh, pursue industrial policy, and Kirk Campbell referred to that in terms of chips. And we see it, yeah. um, and 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 I, as a you know, kind of a an, a free uh, a free market absolutist, right? I just I hate I, I hate this in principle, but you know the reality is is impinging on my beliefs that maybe in some ways, not always, and I think we need to do it maybe in a limited fashion, without giving up our essence, you know, changing our own essence, which is our strength. Perhaps we need to pursue some of that as well. And I think TSMC in Phoenix is, or wherever it is, some up on the Black Canyon Highway somewhere, is an example of what's essentially a political project. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think all sides of the triangle are grappling with how can we make this work economically and commercially within the con overall context of a political project. And I, I think that I think they're, they're grappling with that. And these are some pretty intractable problems they're dealing with. Yeah, and I think that there's definitely space for us um, here at the U of A um, to really, I think it's a it's a responsibility for us at least to to get people more aware of of the complexities mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that they need the knowledge um, to to be able to handle all of this. But let mm -hmm. me, I, sometimes, you know, I wonder if Arizona is really ready for all of this, <laughs> um, you know. Um, so, yeah, do we... Um, you know, Frank, you and I can talk forever, but I just wanted to make sure that we are we are getting the questions from the audience. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience that I have missed or that you are thinking about? Um, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Frank talked about the population. So I'm thinking that uh, West is only... 12% of world's population and 88% uh, of world's population are known West. So if the known West uh, would tolerate China to be number one, so why the West wouldn't be able to uh, uh, tolerate China's rise and also China's rise might be unstoppable. It's already very strong. So if you want to uh, prevent China from having the highest or the most advanced chips, that probably wouldn't be successful. So that, that's what I think. Maybe China's rise is unstoppable. I don't uh... know whether you agree or not. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, th I think there are a couple of parts to your, your your comments, which are great comments, by the way. Uh, and I just want to just kind of go back to what I said in my opening comments is we can't stop China's rise. <laughs> it's it's a fool's errand to think we can, um, generally speaking. Um, China should rise. Uh, there are 1.3 billion people in, in China who deserve to rise and who, who deserve uh a greater material existence and more personal liberty. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, China should rise and we should 
facilitate that to the extent it doesn't undermine our own interests. Um, and and, and uh, so, as I said in my comments, you know, we shouldn't be in the business of containing China or preventing China from rising. Rather, we should be trying to channel it in ways that are we believe are good for the global the global economy and the global world uh, and that are constructive. So I, I agree with you. China's going to rise whether we think it will or not. Um, now, your comment specifically about chips, I think, is a little more is a little more complex because I tend to agree with you. I think the answer to staying ahead in technology is staying ahead in technology, <laughs> not not in preventing your competitors, you know, keeping them down, but maintaining your lead. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's true in general. I, I think the last five years have maybe driven that home uh, to to the United States, and and so I think there's being you know more concern about staying ahead as opposed to keeping others down. But uh, I, I think there's also some merit to in the short term, you know, maintaining your advantage to the extent you can, uh, while you are focusing on on staying ahead. You can do both at the same time. Uh, one doesn't exclude the other. Thank you, yeah, Bob. Another thing, another thing is that probably there won't be a war between Taiwan and China because tomorrow Xi Jinping and Ma Yingjiu, the past yeah. president of uh, Taiwan, <laughs> Republic China, will meet. Tomorrow we'll have this um, rare meeting, you know. Yeah, so, well, I hope there's no I hope there's no war soon because a week from today I'm flying to Taipei. So, <laughs> and then and then three weeks after that I'm flying to Beijing. So, you know, guys, let's keep things cool at least for a while. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep the love triangle and love triangle. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for participating. Yeah. Thank you, Bao Shi. Bao Shi is a professor emeritus here in the department as well and a historian. Um, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, um, I'm trying to be conscious of time, and um, I think we're actually going to end uh, about now. Thank you very much for all of uh, your attendance, um, and thank you very much, Frank, uh, for this wonderful discussion. I think all of us have learned um, quite a bit um and uh let's keep doing what we're doing and have to, hopefully we'll help with you know the people to people uh diplomacy between china and the us thank you again and have a good night bye everyone thank you bye